So I think all of us can agree as retro gamers, collectors, what have you, that we're missing something nowadays with games going digital. You know, the feel of actually having the game, taking the cellophane off, opening it up, just that smell of the new game. You guys all know what I'm talking about. But the biggest thing that has already been going away is that there's no more manuals. No more. I just picked up Grand Theft Auto V, a highly ambitious, amazing game for the PlayStation 4, and the manual, I shit you not, including the cover, is four pages. So of course you have your health and safety warnings because clearly we all read that. The next is getting started with your PlayStation. Yeah, we all need to know how to do that. And then two pages dedicated to controls. Why? <laughs> And then of course, your end user license agreement. Fuck you, fuck you. I miss manuals so much. So what I wanna do today is go over five of my favorite manuals just picked for my collection. First up, Kirby's Adventure on NES. So the first thing that you see when you open this up, aside from the table of contents, is Kirby in these five adorable expressive poses that just shows off his character so well and just tells you about the crisis in Dreamland. Then the intro even has these rings that make it feel like a spinal notebook. And the intro story even reads like a children's bedtime story complete with illustrations. All the pages are color coded. All of them have really cool animations and clips from the game showing you what you're gonna get into. Then how to make Kirby move. A little bit better than the Grand Theft Auto manual, I'd say, in that every single move animation you have in the game has a nice little illustration next to it and a description of how to do it. And that continues on for pages, too. We have four of them, in fact. And it just keeps going, even with, you know, Kirby eating an enemy to spitting one out. And then there's a huge description here because this was the first time, correct me if I'm wrong, that Kirby could steal enemies' abilities. So there's a huge two-page spread showing you how to do it, limitations on how to do it, and then all these little cool icons of different animations throughout the game of how everything looks so cool and so different depending on what enemy Kirby has taken. And I personally, I love the bonus game in this, that it's an Old West style shootout that you have, and Kirby just looks adorable with that little belt and that silly little hat that he's wearing. And of course, if you're a collector of Nintendo games, we're all familiar with the memo section in the back of all the instruction manuals. But this one, just, it looks like the end of the book, the spirals are out, and that Kirby is sitting here with a little pointer telling you, yes, please, please write your memos in right here. Next up, it's a big one, but it needs to be included, Super Mario 3. And yes, mine's missing the cover. Let's just pretend it's there. Much better. As soon as you open it up, first page, boom, Bowser is back, and he's brought his seven crazy Koopa kids, who I just realized recently are all named after seven musicians. Much like Kirby's Adventure, the drawings on the side are absolutely fantastic for each of Mario's new movements, which, if you could think back to 1988, this was a big deal that Mario could fly or wear a frog suit and swim underwater or that he can actually pick up shells instead of just kicking them. That changed everything for us. Even little things right here, like when you turn into the Tanuki statue, that enemies won't notice you and you have a little Koopa Troopa right there looking at Mario with a question mark above his head. It's details like that that I love. For your new techniques, the drawings just continue of different steps of how to run with a shell, how to kick a shell, how to break a block, which again was a totally new thing for us when Mario 3 came out. Even sliding down a hill, that's still so satisfying, sliding down and just kicking your way through a bunch of Goombas. And then this part right here, the lifts, which just added so many dynamic things to the platforming of the donut blocks that would fall away, lifts that would go along the different rails, the rotary lifts that come in in World 5, I believe, and then the directional lifts that you see underground, the ones that'll either take you in one direction or the ones with the exclamation mark where you could switch the direction to go. So you have the pages talking about the different eight kingdoms. And I always loved when manuals would do something like this give an air of secrecy to it by World 4, it'll show you what the map looks like, but oh no, you're gonna get the grayed out screenshots right here with question marks on them, and that continues on for World 5, 6 and 7, and then the elusive World 8, where you get nothing at all. And this always mystified me right here too. We have Lemmy Koopa saying, how far can Mario go? I hope he doesn't make it this far. Dad has many complicated tricks waiting for him in the Dark Land. And the weird part, I've even heard about some new weapon that Dad has been making. Does that mean the tanks, the ship, the little hands that come down and pull you in? I never understood what it exactly was because it sounds like they're referring to like one big gigantic thing that you're going to have to face in the dark world. And then to sum it all up, 
to Mario players, an entire message written here, yours truly, the Mario staff. I mean, they really knew that they went above and beyond with this manual just to sign it like that to all of us. Next up, another one that has amazing color, amazing design, and opens up with a story, The Legend of Zelda. Right away, as you open it up, giant two-color spread and the entire story of Hyrule right here, written out for you. Again, this was one that I read all the time as a kid. But right away, the elusiveness of Ganon. Page 5, hints on how to destroy Ganon. Just all these little things talking about Link's journey through Hyrule everything that he went through. It draws you into the world of Hyrule right here. It just gives you that air of mystery that you're going to be exploring all these dungeons and all these different amazing places throughout the world. It just it pulls you right in and it makes you just so excited to play the game. The little drawings that were done here were translated so well into the 8-bit sprite counterparts. They all look really cool. Even the little fairy design of the pink dress pretty much has that same design there. Yeah, it's red. My favorites of the illustrations, though, were the ones of the enemies. These have so much detail. When I was playing the game, I didn't see the Octoroks looking like these little octopi. I saw them as these big, ugly creatures spitting giant rocks at you. I saw the Leavers as these giant sand-dwelling creatures that had these big horns that were drilling up through the sand. But what better way to wrap this up than with a beginner's walkthrough to level 1 and showing you all the basic steps that you need to get your sword and everything just to get you started and even on top of that a map getting you to level 2 I cannot tell you how helpful this was when I first played this game when I was 7 years old so for this next one it's debatable is it a manual is it a guide but it came with the game and that is the Earthbound Player's Guide and I swear one of these days I will get through a video without mentioning Earthbound I promise you so when you first open it up, the first few pages are just that, a manual of teaching you the basic controls of the game, introducing you to the four characters, and different uh, decisions that you'll be making throughout the game, game screens and command windows, all that kind of stuff, just basically how to fight. But then, you get to this page, the Earthbound Travel Guide, and that's exactly what this is. It's a guide to the entire world of Earthbound and how crazy and weird and awesome it is. All the different openings read kind of like a newspaper with all different clippings and things like that, talking about all sorts of different things that happen throughout the game, like the meteorite crashing right in the beginning, the giant step that holds the psychic power kind of foreshadowing, you know, all the psychic places that you're going to be visiting in the game. And then there's always these fun facts here, which I think are hilarious, because it has a population of people, dogs, an average temperature, average rainfall, and they just get more ridiculous as the guide goes on. Like right here, for example, in Dalam, you have your population, average temperature, shrines, princes, and then your average temper tantrums, which is zero, because everybody is just so calm. But as a guide, though, it is insanely detailed. Every town that you get to has these travel steps that tell you every major point that you need to hit in order to get through the game in advance. Also, this big and bright colorful map with a map key telling you every single place that would be of some kind of interest to you. And again, really nice touches to make each town feel very unique. There's the taste of Tucson down here, little things that are sold in Berglund Park. In Happy Happy Village, there's the list of what's sold at the drugstore. Then in Foresight, you have an entire page dedicated to the store directory of the grand reopening of the grand department store, which is four floors and has, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven stores. But even later on in the guide, it points out a lot of things that you really need to take advantage of once the game ramps up its difficulty. Like in Deep Darkness, it hints that you should buy the piggy nose and search out the magic truffles. It gives you X's on the map of where they're all hidden. Helps out so much. I could go on and on and on all day of how much I love this guide. I just want to hit on the few highlights here. So let's move on to the last one that I got on my list. Now for this last one, Kind of a weird pick, but it's my all-time favorite manual, and that is SimCity Dr. Wright's Guide to Urban Planning. Now at the time, the simulation genre was really new. I mean, the only game I could possibly think of besides SimCity was ActRaiser that had some semblance of simulation to it, but this was a full sim game. So besides the guide opening up again with Bowser, much like Super Mario 3, it just shows you about all the destruction and crazy shit that you can do with your cities. But there's so much more if monsters are not enough, and that is the bulk of the game, getting started. So, it walks you through the game of each major step that you get to of building your city from a tiny little village, stage one, 
all the way to a giant megalopolis, which is 500,000 people. And in this game, it's pretty difficult to do that. And you got little Dr. Wright here, who kind of acts as the mascot throughout the game and walks you through. And the way everything is written is it's directly talking to you, the player, explaining everything and just making everything nice and friendly and saying, hey, this is a really big game, but that we're going to do it in small steps so you can take everything in and grow at the game and have fun with it. So it starts with little step-by-steps, how to put down residential, commercial, industrial zones, placing power, roads, all the basic necessities that you're going to need to start building your city. And also we'll show different strategies of would you want to put your power plant right in the middle of your landform or off to the side or by a coastline to reduce pollution. Then you have these things here which I absolutely love and that's the right files and what they are, they're about fictional cities and how they were built and essentially what went wrong with them. So this one in particular is about Doodle. It's about this woman who was on the phone and wrote all these lines all over this map. The map was picked up by the guys to lay down the roads the next day and laid them out in a mess like a doodle. So therefore, the city completely failed because transportation was an absolute mess. But the way it ends was even the mayor gave up on doodle and moved to New Hampshire. There's a whole bunch of these, like this other one, Gearhead about another city with too many roads and the city failed because of that but I always thought it would be funny if the joke was that the mayor would give up and move to New Hampshire after their city failed. As you go on and your city gets bigger it shows you different ways to really expand your zones how to place new zones, fill it with parks so you'll reduce uh, pollution and keep your land values up also adding a police station you gotta keep the crime down because it will get crazy if you don't watch it how to add new zones again place more parks and boom your town will grow but this right here blew my mind. I actually went through all the maps finding this exact landform to build this town, or city I should say, exactly as this, which was Wrighton, the megalopolis that Dr. Wright himself designed. And look how happy he is about it. With industrial zones all the way on the outside, so only half the pollution is in the city, and then residential and commercial just peppered throughout. But this one, much like Earthbound, I can go on and on and on about it all day. I mean, it's 84 pages, and that's absolutely crazy for a manual. So I couldn't recommend tracking down a copy of SimCity, but if you do, make sure you get it with the manual. So thank you so much for watching, guys. And please, tell me in the comments below, what are some of your favorite manuals? Just crazy ones, weird ones, ones that you like, ones that you hate. I'd love to hear from you. Speed painting's next week, I promise. And as always, keep it pixelated.